Okay, thank you. And uh, we, when you look at the scripture, there's so much confusion that's going on today. And it's because people just do not rightly divide the scriptures. And that's why there are so many denominations and different types of churches and on and on it goes. Because there's a real problem. If you just go into scriptures and take out a verse, uh, without its context, you are misinterpreting that verse. Amen. And you have to be careful with that, don't you? And so, uh, so for some of our friends today that are visiting with us today, I thought I'd just do this real simple. And uh, it might help a light come on, we hope. And uh, I know that uh, I was saved at the age of 24 by a faithful uh, pastor uh, who preached. And uh, it wasn't until years later that I was introduced to rightly dividing. And the scales came off of my eyes in some areas. Uh, I always tried to explain certain verses, you know what I mean? And, uh, but they never came clear to me. Uh, they, I always had problems with them. And uh, so, uh, it just, but you just pass them over and just go and do what you do. And so I became, just like most pastors, I would kind of devotionalize the scripture. You know, what? I, I take a verse out and just kind of apply it to us without its proper interpretation. I would do my best. I would teach books of the Bible, give its background, stuff like that when I go verse by verse. But a lot of times I would devotionalize. And when I began to realize what this was all about, that back here is the prophetic program. And the prophetic program was to the nation of Israel. And uh, the nation of Israel, of course, they were under law. They had different requirements than we do today. And uh, they, they had to be uh, circumcised. Uh, they had to be uh, water baptized, okay, uh, as they came along. And a lot of things. And they had to do sacrifices. They had to do works. And they could lose their salvation. Whereas you come today after Israel finally rejected, rejected Christ when they stoned Stephen. Then God raised up a new apostle. His name is Paul. And this is called the gospel of grace, the mystery of Christ, the dispensation of grace right here. And that's where we are today. Now I can make application from back here. But I have to be careful that I don't take its doctrine and move it over to here. Because then that mixes it and confuses it then. Okay? One day, we're going up in the rapture. Uh, trumpet will sound and we're going up. The body of Christ, we're going up. Amen? <laughs> now, when we go up, God resumes his dealings with Israel that he had temporarily set aside. And that begins here. And they will go through the tribulation Christ will return and set up his kingdom. But the prophetic program resumes after we're raptured out of here. So I have to be careful when I look at the scriptures. I always ask who is he writing to, when, what, why, all these things. Okay? Now the reason that's so important is because when I begin to look at this thing just very, very simply called salvation. I read a little booklet uh, uh, a few years ago. Uh, Simple as Can Be by Dr. Uh, Cornelius Stamm. And I, I read that and it really helped me. And I hope that some of the things that I say today will help you. Most of us know the story of Lazarus and the rich man. Uh, these are two individual people. Lazarus was a beggar. He would beg at the doorstep of this rich man who lived sumptuously. And, uh, but both men died one day. And one man, Lazarus, ended up in paradise. We would call that heaven today for us, okay? The other man, he, will, he awakened in a place of torment called hell. And so we ask ourselves, what made the difference? One in heaven, in a sense, and then one in hell. What made the difference? And the difference was one man had faith in what God had said and the other man didn't believe. And that's the bottom line. One believed, one didn't believe in what God had said to them. Okay? Uh, I remember my mother. I remembered her and, and uh, one day, I mean for many years, I led my mom to Christ when she was 63. And... Uh, 
Before, she couldn't say she was saved, but afterwards, she could. And boy, there's a difference when you believe and you don't believe. I mean, there really is. Uh, over at the old Red Brick Church building over there on Stones Crossing, <clears throat> there was a house next to us there, and there was a family that lived there, a uh, single guy with a uh, son, daughter, and so on. And anyway, the son came by one day, and we talked to him, witnessed to him, and he, he asked Christ to save him. Uh, a couple weeks later, he was in a car, his grandmother's car, coming down Stones Crossing and lost control and hit a tree and it killed him. Uh, I talked to his father and his father told me, oh, I don't want anything to do with that. You know, just leave us alone. I said, fine, you know. And anyway, he went out shortly after that and he went out on his sailboat and it the mask came around and hit him, knocked him in the water unconscious, and he drowned. And I was thinking, as Lazarus and the rich man, <laughs> one believed and one did not believe. And boy, what a difference they are experiencing even today. Amen? Now, I don't know about you. I want to make sure myself that I'm going to heaven. And I have taken that, that, that measure. I've asked Christ to save me personally. I've put my faith in him in the gospel. So I know that I'm saved, but I want my family, I want my friends, as many as possible, to be able to go to heaven with me. Uh, heaven is just a continuing on with life. Continuing on in life with those who've passed on before me, one day I'll be with them again and we'll just continue on life once again. Amen. And it's going to be a great time. I was listening to uh, Greg Lowry the other night and Greg Lowry was saying that when his little boy was growing up, he'd ask him a million questions. And he couldn't quite say it. He said, what's that? What's that? You know? And he said, well, you know, that's the car. You know? Said, what's that? You know? And he'd ask him these questions. Well, his son, uh, who's a young man, uh, he died. Uh, it was very tragic. And he went on to be in heaven. And Greg says, one day... I'll go to heaven, and it'll be my first time. He's already there. We're going to resume our life together one day, he said. But, you know, I'm going to ask him. I'm going to say, what's that? He's going to say, well, that, that's the throne of God. What's that? Well, that's the angelic choir. He... Amen. So it's true that the fathers will become the children. The children will become the father. <laughs> Anything. But I thought that was cute when I heard him say that. There's an old saying, born once, you die twice. You're born physically, and then without Christ, you go on and you will experience the second death, which is cast into the lake of fire. Okay? They say if you're born twice, once physically, once spiritually, because you've been saved, you die only once. You die physically, but you won't die the second death. Okay? But it's a possibility you can be born twice, once physically, once spiritually, and never have to die ever again if you get to go up in the rapture that takes place right here. Amen. That's what I'm hoping for. That's what I'm praying for, okay? Now, why do we need to be saved or have spiritual, a spiritual birth in the first place? Romans chapter 5, verse 12. And I want you to notice as we go through this where these verses are found. Just kind of look on your screen. You can see the verses up there good enough. And just kind of notice where, they're, where, they come, where they are in Israel's program, in the body of Christ program, or in Israel's program. Just kind of notice that as we go through this, okay? Uh, first of all, wherefore is by one man, Adam, sin entered in the world. And death by sin. See, sin produces what? Death. And so death passed up on all men, for that all have sinned. And then Romans 3.10. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. How many good people, righteous people are there in this world? There's none. We're all sinners. You see, Adam, who represented us, he fell. And when he fell, we became guilty. We're his descendants. And so when we were born, we inherited his sinful DNA. And as a result of that, we are sinners. Okay? Regardless of how good people try to be, there's none righteous, no, not one. As a matter of fact, our human effort is as filthy rags, the Bible says. Okay? Uh, verse uh, 12 says this. 
They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. You know, now there are certain things uh, a lost person can do that's kind and so on. I understand that. But you don't, it's not good until you do it for God Almighty and His glory. Okay? And then he says in verse 23, for how many? All have sinned and come short of the glory. We're all sinners. Well, none of us, anybody here sinless or perfect, stand up. Huh? And if you're a man, your wife will tell you different immediately. I know that. <laughs> Amen. Now here's the problem. Okay? Revelation 21, verse 3. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more. What produces death? Sin. So that means in heaven one day there will be no more sin. Okay? Now I'm going to skip the rest of that, guys, okay? But I just want to show you we have a sin problem, and no sin will ever be allowed to go to heaven. So is there an answer for us? Okay? Well, there is. We'll give ours first, okay? Romans chapter 4, verse 24. But for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Jesus Christ came, he died for our sins, was buried, he rose again, so that we can be justified or have a right standing before Almighty God. That's what we have to believe. It's real clear, is it not? 2 Corinthians 5.21 For he hath made him, Christ, to be sin for us on the cross, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. When Christ died for us, when we put our faith in his death, burial, and resurrection, Christ forgives us all of our sins and gives us his righteousness. It's his righteousness, not ours, that we need. <laughs> and it's that righteousness that the Father accepts us. Okay? And then also in Acts chapter 16, this is pretty clear, and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house, if they also believe. So that's pretty simple. That's pretty clear. Faith alone in Christ and the gospel alone. Hmm? That's it. However, because of traditions, a lot of churches, denominations, personal opinions, wrong Bible interpretations, as a result of that, Christendom as a whole is in complete chaos because they cannot agree on anything. <laughs> Hello? Okay? There's lots of confusion. When I said to you, now, there was one listening who's from the Roman Catholic Church. And he's a member, and he's unable to control himself. So he stands up, and he says, wait a minute. He's leading you astray. Faith, yeah, yes, but also works. And then he gives his list of rituals, masses, baptism, Mary, purgatory, all the sacraments and everything. And he will even use scripture. James 2, 14. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? Then he'll use verse 24. You see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only? So he says, listen, faith's not enough. You need works. And here's the list of the works. But I remind you, where was that found? Okay. Then a Christian church member and a Church of Christ member, they stand up. They say, listen, the preacher here who says just have faith in Christ and the gospel alone, uh, he makes it too easy. And then the Roman Catholic Church guy, he, uh, he makes it too hard. So all you need to do is believe, but also you need to be water baptized. You know, to be water baptized, to wash away your sins, to receive the Holy Spirit, and then maintain faith and works. Then they might use scriptures like Acts 2.38. 
Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Okay? Mark 16, 16, they might use. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. See how things begin to get a little confusing. Then there's a charismatic and a Pentecostal sitting by. They have a lot of churches. He's upset. He's mad, almost exploding. He asked the Christian church guy and the Church of Christ guy, he said, listen, why don't you read the rest of the verses? It's perfectly plain. Mark 16, 16 again. He that believeth is baptized shall be saved. That's pretty clear. Okay? But what he says, go on, read the rest. Verse 17 and 18. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. And they shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. You see, if you don't have tongues, signs, and wonders in the miraculous... You're not a true believer. You see, what, you, what you're doing is you're denying what these scriptures say, and you can't do that. It calls for faith, water baptism, some works as requirements for salvation, while the miraculous powers are the evidences of your salvation. If you're truly saved, you'll have these in your life. And the fact you don't have them means you're not truly saved say and the confusion increases I remember one time I went to an apostolic church over in Ohio I went with a friend uh, he had been running from God and he wanted to get right and he, so we went to a revival of his wife's church and I went there and they were doing a number of things and so on lots of people speaking in tongues and everything like that so I just you know everybody was standing up I stood at the back and about that time, the preacher and evangelist started coming toward me. I said, here we go. <laughs> I said, this is going to be fun. <laughs> I said, God, give me a verse. <laughs> and so anyway, they came back there. Hi, introduced themselves. They're very nice. And they said, have you ever spoken in tongues? I said, no, I haven't. They said, well, you're not saved. And I said, uh, well, could you show me a verse in the Bible that says that I'm not saved if I haven't spoken in tongues? They looked at me. They turned around, and they went back to the platform. <laughs> That's the honest truth. Isn't that amazing? Now, listen, if I, were, if I were banking my eternity on something, I would have some verses for it, okay? And so the Lord was good that night to me. But after all these things, observing, there's another man who's sitting by. He said, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're all wrong. You see, because he's a seventh-day Adventist, and he says, you have to keep the law, and you have to keep the Sabbath. Huh? And he might use Exodus 20 and show the Ten Commandments and so on, or restrictions on certain foods and everything like that. Or he might use Exodus 31, verse 14, 15. You shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy unto you. Every one that defileth it shall surely be put to death, for whosoever doeth any work there. And so, and so we say, wait a minute, that's a law. And then he might use then James 2, 10. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. We're still under it somewhat. Huh? And so all these things are coming on. Now, you have a lost person, a person who's never been saved. And they're seeing this, they're hearing this in their churches, on TV, and to them it becomes so confusing. And is there an answer? Of course there's an answer. If you want to know how to be saved and know you are saved and know you are going to heaven, it can be simple, clear, and understandable if... You recognize your place in history. 2 Timothy 2.15 says this, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. 
You see, I don't get confused if I stay within my history that's to me, that's for me. All the Bible is for me. I can make application. I can learn great truths. However, only this from Romans through Philemon is it specifically written to me. Okay? Then... I'm not thrown for a loop when somebody says this, says this, and says that, and so on. And so the question is this here, where are these verses found? To who was God writing? What program were the people under? And what was required of them to be saved? Are they under the mystery program or under the prophetic program to the nation of Israel? That has nothing to do with us at all today. Here's today, Galatians 1, 11 and 12. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Paul, the apostle who was saved in Acts 9, he comes on the scene and says, God has revealed to me a new message that no man knew previously, and he has personally come and revealed it to me. He says in Romans 16, 25, Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. He states in Ephesians 3, 2 and 3, If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you word, right here where we are today, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in a few words. He says in Colossians 1.25, Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery, which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. Paul says, listen. I was a Jew. I was a Pharisee of Pharisees. But on the Damascus Road, God knocked me down and he saved me. And not only that, he began to reveal to me that his people were set aside temporarily and now he has a new mystery program, a new gospel message that's just for the body of Christ. That's who we are, we're in today if we're saved. And as he began to reveal that, he said, it's my gospel. Saying that was not being conceited. Saying that separated, differentiated his message from the twelve's message and previous message by the prophets. And he says this in Ephesians 6, 19. And for me that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. And then he says uh, in uh, Romans 2, 16. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Today, you die without Christ, you will stand before God and be judged why you didn't believe in this gospel that's for today. Not back here's gospel, not over here's gospel, but why you didn't believe in Paul's gospel right here. Hello? Okay? And then we have to ask ourselves, what is Paul's gospel that saves today? Acts 20, verse 24, the last part of that verse, which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Paul's gospel is one of grace. And what that means, that, that means there's nothing humanly we can do or have to do of ourselves. We don't have to join a church. We don't have to be baptized. We don't have to give our money. We don't have to follow a list of rules. We don't have to follow the law. We don't have to offer sacrifices. We don't have to follow those ordinances. Hello? And that's what most of Christendom does today. It's all of grace. It's based upon what some other individual person did for us and gives it to us, offers it to us as a gift. If we just believe it. And faith is not a work. So you put your faith, which is not a work, 
You put your heart, you believe Christ is the Son of God. He died for your sins, was buried and rose again, and bam, you can get saved. And when you get saved, you can know you're going to heaven. Amen. Amen. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. That's what we put our faith in. He's the Son of God. He died for our sins, was buried, and he rose from the grave alive. If I will put my faith in him and his work and that alone, God says, I'll save you this very moment. Okay? Romans 4, 5. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him. Not works, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. My faith in Christ and the gospel forgives all my sins and Christ's righteousness is placed to my account, guaranteeing me heaven. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, you know it well. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, the next verse says. Okay, not of works, lest any man should boast. And so God says, I've removed all works of any kind. It's all by grace. Just believe. Believe this gospel message and I'll save you. No law, no works, no Sabbath, no baptism, no miraculous. Just faith in his son and his finished work. D.L. Moody said to two Mormons who were trying to convince him one needed to do this, do this, do this, and do that. He said, the difference between your religion and mine, yours is do, do, mine is done, done. <laughs> Amen. I've given on several occasions, but I felt like it fit here because of some visitors Let's say you have a dog and it falls into a, an outhouse hole and he's down there and all that stuff. You have some decisions to make. Number one, you can leave that dog down in there and he dies. Number two, you can put a ladder down in there and hope that he can climb out on his own. Or number three, you can go down in there yourself and all that stuff, get a hold of that dog and carry him out of that stuff up to safety. You and I, we were in the stuff. We were in sin, in muck and mire of sin. Christ, and the Father and the Trinity, they had a decision to make. Jesus Christ could just let us go on in our sin and die and go straight to hell. Or he could put a ladder down and, and hope that some way we could work our way up that ladder, but all comes short of the glory of God. Nobody's able to do that. Or he could come down into the midst of that humanity of, of sin and mire and muck himself and give us a way to get out of there and bring us up. And Jesus Christ did that. Jesus Christ did that on an old rugged cross and mankind thought they had won. They crucified him, but it was for our sins. It was his purpose. He permitted that. If they would have known what it would accomplish, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory, the Bible states. And three days later, bam, he defeats the chains of hell and death itself. Amen. Amen. And that takes away the fear of death in a sense. We can be anxious, but we know where we're going if we know Christ. One last thing. It's by our faith we identify ourselves with Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection. When I put my faith in Christ and his finished work, it's at that moment by faith his death, his burial, his resurrection becomes mine. I'll be saved when I do that. Here recently, we saw the awful events in Kenya. And I just found out yesterday, uh, uh, Ben, uh, he was at y'all's house, and a missionary 
uh, the Philippines, Kenya, some other, uh, Indonesia, places like that. And uh, he was telling me the story, I thought it was wonderful, that at the shopping mall, the terrorists, they were going, they were killing everybody, you know, except Muslims, and they were killing the people. And there was an India lady, and she was lying next to a young, a young man who had been shot. And he was still breathing, but there was a large pool of blood next to him. This lady from India, she says, I knew the terrorists, they were backtracking to make sure that the people were dead. So what she did, she rode over into that young man's pool of blood and wallowed in it some and then laid there and had blood all over her, okay? Now get this. She took on the appearance of that young man's blood and it worked. She was spared. She identified herself with that boy's blood. Now get this. Another's blood and death saved her. Likewise, there's another who shed his blood for us and rose again in life. That is the only way of salvation. It's not all this other stuff that people are screaming you have to do yourself. It's all been accomplished by the great and precious Son of God. This here is where we are. You can make those points that other denominations and churches use if you get out of context and you use verses that was meant to the people of Israel under the law and them alone. That's why there's so much confusion that's going on today. Amen? Now, if you were to die this moment, where would you go? Do you know where you would go? Would it be paradise? Or will you have to experience a second death? Let's bow our heads. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I tried to show you as best as I could scripturally. And that's what matters, not my church. But what does the Bible say? What is the truth of the word of God? And I believe it's very, very clear. What you need to do today is understand you're a sinner. You can't save yourself. But you do believe that Christ came. He's the son of God. He died for your sins, was buried, and rose again. And what he has done in that alone, what he accomplished is sufficient, is enough to save you, Once and for all eternity. All you have to do is believe that in your heart. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. You would say, Pastor Jim, I want to know that I'm saved. I want to know that I'm going to heaven. I can't say that this moment. I'm going to say a prayer. And if that's your heart, and you believe it in your heart, I'm going to say a prayer. Just repeat this prayer after me right there where you're seated. Saying the prayer doesn't save you unless you believe it in your heart. And the reason you should believe it in your heart is because the Word of God teaches its truth. Just say this prayer right where you are. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. I do believe that Jesus Christ is your son. He died for my sin and rose again. The best way I know how, please Save me for Jesus' sake. I believe. And if you prayed that prayer and you meant it with all your heart, 
God promises us that he would save us if we would call on him in that faith of that gospel. He says, you're saved then if you met that in your heart. Father, thank you for the gospel of grace. Thank you for providing everything necessary for our salvation, the Lord Jesus Christ and his work. And I just pray that we as believers now, that we would have that confidence, that assurance, not arrogance, but humility, to think that you loved us that much and have, have, have done all of this just for us. We are what we are by your wonderful grace in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Amen.